problems. And I used to think that was incredible to me because all I knew were crazy cream people. <laughs> I mean, my girlfriend texted her and I talked about this earlier. It's like, I feel like Koreans can be divided into three, like crazy, crazy, or crazy. <laughs> and I love every one of them. <laughs> These are my people. I feel very possessive and proud of them. But I started to talk about it, and I remember I was on a program for NPR, and she said, I can't believe you mentioned that you see a shrink. And I thought, Everybody I like and respect sees a shrink, so <laughs> I don't have a problem with it. But going back to this whole word of dysfunctional, I guess I want to say is that, on a serious note, I feel that this world is incredibly broken. And I don't know how to fix it. But I do believe that individuals are broken. I feel like our spirits are breaking. And I think at this time in the world right now, we feel incredibly vulnerable. So unless we start talking about the brokenness and how to fix it, we're not going to get better. And obviously the microcosm is the individual, but then within that structure we have the family. So if each person is broken, I believe that the family is having a dynamic of brokenness, which is causing the bigger problem. So for me, I hope that transparency is, you know, the beginning of the solution. I remember we were having a discussion two days back and you mentioned growing up in a rural Pennsylvania mm -hmm. right. as a, um, a lone biracial child for miles around and how that sort of led to feelings of uh, alienation and mm -hmm. questions of identity. So does that sort of uh, inspire you uh, when you write in terms of seeking out uh, answers to uh, through fiction? Is that childhood experience very important to you? First let me say what I forgot to say at the beginning, which is that I'm very grateful to be here. I've had a great time this week um, seeing other events and doing, doing my own events. And uh, I've never been to Asia before, uh, before this week, and my mother is Chinese, so it's, uh, I'm glad that I made it here finally uh, in my life. And um, the festival and now the Asia Society today has made that possible for me. Uh, gave me the opportunity to be here, so, and uh, as well, um, uh, you know, speaking today with Manreet and, and Jin and all the other people I've read with, it's been, it's been um, just great. Uh, but yeah, I mean, my my writing is autobiographical. You you, you say it's um, uh, a fictionalization of of things that that happened to me, and I I guess that maybe that's a a genre of writing. Um, uh, that uh, you know, it might be an official category. I don't know, but all I uh, I do talk about the fact that um, you know, my my parents, uh, my mother was Chinese, my father was of Polish descent, and that made me not quite like one or not quite like the other parent. Uh, so the question of identity has been something that I've been trying to answer uh, all my life because um, in my case it's all I guess in everyone's case. It's it's a uh, it's a unique thing. It's something you have to figure out for yourself. And in my case, um, it was maybe harder to figure out, maybe harder to answer uh, what my identity was or is. Uh, and the the writing might be a way to work through that, um, work through that issue. Uh, and the um, and you're right about the the, the title uh, means touched in the head. Touched is a rural. Uh, term, slang term, uh, that I heard when I was growing up. I don't hear it so much now, and a lot of people actually don't know that word, and I have to explain it, but I heard it growing up uh, in, in the country, and, and I just want to say everyone in this book is, is uh, attached. It's not just <laughs> one character, um, it's not just the narrator, it's everyone. <laughs> Actually, I just told this earlier at the 12.30, so if you've heard this before, forgive me. <laughs> but um, when asked, you should always answer. My friend worked at an investment bank, and at, he told me that after a deal closes, depending upon the department and depending on the kind of deal, after the event ends, you would get a free lunch. So if you had an Indian power plant a debt issuance, and all of a sudden after the deal closes, you would have free Indian food. And interestingly, my friend said that some of the wealthiest people in the room would really just push other people out of the way to get first in line and to take a huge pile of food. And my friend also explained that some of the, the, the most famous person actually made like seven or eight million dollars a year. 
And I grew up under fairly modest circumstances, and I thought that was extraordinary. And I used to just wonder, well, how do people get rich? How do people stay rich? How do people, I don't know, not lose all their money? How do people function? And with money, because for me, money is a very interesting thing. I don't really understand it. I'm very ambivalent about it, but I respect it. I have a lot of respect for money. Anyway, and we all do, I guess. We're, we're all forced to. And so I wanted to write a story about, oh, there's free food for millionaires. And then my friend told me that it's a novel, so uh, I ended up writing a novel about it, and it took quite a long time. But that's how the title began. But it also means metaphorically that I believe that we're all millionaires, because each of us has um, individual gifts that nobody else has. And that the gift that we really have that we didn't earn is grace. And grace is defined as divine unmerited favor. And I was really interested in this whole notion of divine unmerited favor, the fact that somebody could be short or tall or smart or fast or hospitable or unkind or kind, and all these things can be seen in a way as gifts. So I wanted to make that argument, and hence I used James Baldwin's quotation as my epigram, that our crowns have been bought and paid for. All we have to do is wear them. And for me, what it really means is that each of us actually possesses an extraordinary crown to which we could lay claim.